you to to look at this scripture this morning um, that I believe that Paul is trying to relate a message to the people. And uh, I, I've titled this, uh, The End of the Year Spiritual Report. The End of the Year Spiritual Report. And so what I'd like for each of you to do is to think about the year in the past. And if you were going to write a, a spiritual report of, about yourself, about how that uh, you have responded in this past year and how faithful you have been to the Lord in this past year. Because it's been a very difficult year. Well, Paul, everywhere he went, he had difficulties. But here he is giving a report to the uh, elders uh, there at Ephesus as he was preparing to leave from there to go to Jerusalem. And as he was preparing to leave, the Bible said that he called the elders of the church together. And I think what he was doing, and if you'll read the scriptures, and we're going to, we're going to take it pretty much verse by verse this morning. And as you look at the scripture, Paul is uh, giving an inventory of his life and how that he had served Christ and He's going to go over, go through that inventory with uh, the elders there. He's going to try to show a balance in his life where there was pluses in his life or whether there was negatives in his life, whether there was some things that, that he dropped back from or some things that he uh, advanced in. In other words, he's really giving an examination of his life, a report. To these uh, elders of the church. Now it's important. That we understand this. It's important that we examine our own life. And it's a. It's we call ourselves To the carpet. Why? Well because first of all the master's looking at us. The master has observed us. This past year. And he wants to know about our inventory. He wants to know about the, the balances of our life. He wants to know uh, as we examine our life, how do we feel about who we are as a Christian this past year? The master wants to know. But not only is it in observance, is the church body. The church body looks at, at uh, its members and uh, it says uh, to each, each of you says to me, uh, preacher, uh, examine your life. Do an inventory on your life in your leadership of us the past year. And then in return, I say to you as members, as bodies of, the, of Christ, examine your life. Do an inventory of your life also. How was the balance in your life this past year? And then thirdly, there's the loss. The people that don't know Christ who have watched us the past year. And so uh, what, what, how do they look at us as they examine us? What do they see the church as today as a, as a, a, a balance that's been faithful or a church? Churches that have uh, backed up instead of going forward. If you ask the lost people to take an inventory of the body of believers, the church today, what would their report be? What, how would they write that report? Well, that's exactly what Paul is doing here. He's, uh, it's, what he's doing is he is, and when you look at and read all this scripture, Paul is, is giving this report as if, he would never see them people again in this life because he said in the scriptures, it'd be my last time to see you face to face. So he said, here's what I want you to know about me. And you know what? We never know when it'd be the last time that we see each other. And here's what I want you to know about me. And you should say, it might be the last time, preacher, I ever see you again, but I, this is what I want you to know about me. So I hope I can put this all into perspective. We ask, why does it matter? 
Why does it matter? Why does this report matter? Look at what he said in verse 17. And from uh, Miletus, he went, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. In verse 18, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know that from the first day that I came into Asia, after what matter I have been with you in all seasons. So then he's called them together to give his report. Does it matter? You see, that's what we think today, and that's why we act today as if it doesn't matter. We act like it doesn't matter how I live before you. We act like it doesn't matter how we live before Christ. We act like it doesn't matter how we live before lost people. But it matters tremendously. Paul has given us an example of how much it matters. Why? Let's give you three things here. It matters how I have lived and what my report says. Because first of all, it will move the Lord. Always remember that. How you live will move the Lord in his actions in your life. You see, when I pray, I want to move God. When I give, I want to move God. When I preach, I want to move God. Move him what way? A way to bless me. A, ble- a, a way to, to lead me, to empower me, to make me more effective. So it moves the Lord, first of all. But my report, what else will it do? It will inspire the body of Christ. It will inspire each of you. You know that. You know as well as I do. When you look at people and how they live and how that they serve Christ, it inspires you. When I look at you and I see your faith and I see what you, it makes me want to do better. It wants me to be, it makes me want to be stronger. It inspires me. And when I see you have faith, it inspires me to want to illustrate faith also. That's why it's so important that a pastor lead, lead with a good report. Why? Because it will inspire the congregation. It will inspire the people that are sitting on the pews. It will inspire them to follow and to be faithful also. But number three, it will convict sinners. I like convict sinners. Did you know that? The way we live our life will convict those people that are lost. The way we live our life today, it's, it's the conviction that people will see that will make a difference in their life. Now let's start into our inventory this morning. And we'll find this in verse 18. And he said, and when they were come to him, he said unto them. Now this is what he said. And this is what I'm going to say. And this is what I want you to say. Now look at what he said. You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what matter I have been with you all seasons. Now first of all, his priority was his faith. You know how I have lived before you in all seasons, he said. It didn't matter what the circumstances was. He said, I have been faithful in all the seasons. In the difficulties, I have been faithful to you. I have been faithful to tell you what the Lord has told me. I have been faithful to live before you. It's important that we have faith above everything else. If we don't have faith, then none of the other stuff matters. If we don't have faith, the inventory of our life, it will not matter. But it's the faith that is the key. And that's the very first thing that Paul brings to their attention. And I'll put my, he has, he said, I've been faithful in all of the seasons. I have not let the up and downs of life detour me. I have not allowed the up and downs of life to take me away from my responsibility that I have in preaching the gospel and living before you. Faithfulness. How's your faithfulness been? 
Examine yourself. How faithful have you been? I told somebody the other day, I want you to think about this. Can I give you what's on my mind? The church house now has become a gambling house. That's what we've turned it into. I can't come to church because I can't take a chance. I might catch it. In chance, gambling. You know what chance is? And we've turned our church houses into a gambling house. I can't trust you, God. I can't take a chance, God, that you'll let me get sick. I can't take a chance, God. I just can't do it. I've got to stay at home. Paul said, I wasn't that way. He said, in all the seasons, if my life was on the line, I was faithful. If there was leprosy, I was faithful. If there were stripes, I was faithful. If it was imprisonment, I was faithful. Do your inventory. God's house is to never be a gambling house. Every time I come into those doors, I must know that God is on my side and God is with me and God will protect me and I'm where God wants me to be. Faithfulness. I think we can see Sinners hadn't seen much in church this past year, have they? Paul would say, shame on us. You say, why is it so important to go to church? Because it says the first church, they worshiped God daily and they went from house to house. They believed in meeting together and being together. Can I ask you a question? If you're in an army, are you satisfied living with the enemy? Or do you want to get together with your friends? Or your buddies, the ones who think like you and are fighting for the same things you're fighting for? Paul said, I've been faithful in all the seasons that come upon me, the difficulties of life. And then he said something else, verse 19, and I want to make sure you understand this. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in the weight of the Jews. Serving the Lord with all humility. I say all the things that I've just said to you, not in pride, not in bragging that we have had church, that we have continued to meet. I'm humbled that God has inspired me to be here to preach. I am humbled that God has inspired you to be here and to faithfully support his work and to do what he has called us to do. I'm humbled when I look at all of you standing out there in 25 degree temperature just past Saturday, trying to feed people and put food in people's cars and, and giving them some hope with good and kind words. I'm inspired by you. But I'm humbled by There's no place for pride in God's house. Because I'll tell you right now, none of us deserve any of the blessings. It humbles me that God would just let me have the opportunity to preach during this pandemic. It humbles me that God took away the fear of my heart. I 
mind, it won't catch up. I don't want nothing to happen. I really don't, not to myself or to you. But God took away the fear, and he gave me confidence. When I prayed, God, don't let, don't let nobody catch this inside the walls of this church. And don't let nobody inside the walls of this church give it to anybody. When I prayed that, then I had to be faithful to believe God heard that prayer and God would honor it. And that's why having services did not bother me. But I was humbled that God would hear our prayer. Humbled through tears. We've had tears this year. We've had trials this year. And we have faced the powers of the enemies this year like we have never faced it before. With the humility of tears, I look at people, good people, that their inventory is not what they want. I see them and people around me, and my heart goes out to them. I, I do not criticize nobody. Why? Because that's what humility will do for you. It'll help you to be thankful for who you are and what you can write on your report. Because you see, just like Paul, Paul was humble that he could say those things, and I'm humble that I can say them. And I'm humble that you can say them also. Then number three, the first one was the priority was faithfulness. Number two was a humble mind. And number three, look at what he said in verse 20. 20, 20, how about this? That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Read that verse. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house. That's interesting, isn't it? Look at what he said. I did not shrink during the, all of the trials of my life. I did not shrink. I did not become smaller, but I came bigger. He said, I did not withhold what the body needs. And he said, I held back none of those things that were profitable to you. Oh, it's so profitable to all of us when we see each and every one exercising faith in Christ. He said, I held back nothing. I wanted to build your faith. I wanted to know that the God I serve is the same God you can serve. I wanted you to understand that our God is profitable to you, and I held it not back. I held not back the things that would make your life more holy. More holy. It's all profitable to us today. If our faith can be strengthened and holiness can increase. If there's one thing our church needs today and every church needs today is an increase in holiness toward God living more like him practicing it every day of our life he said I gave you examples he said I called out the things that we were doing wrong I called you out when you were abusing the Lord's table I called you out when you were not performing marriages the way they were I called you out Because it's always profitable. What did he say to them about the Lord's Supper? He said, many of you are abusing it and said, some of you are even asleep. In other words, you've died from it. It's pro he said, it was profitable for me to rebuke you. It was profitable for me to tell you of the things that were done to you. And notice something else he said. And I've taught you publicly from house to house. 
He said, not only did I not shrink, but I gave an open show, an open show to the, all of the arenas around me. In other words, he said, i done it publicly so that the lost could see, those that were backslidden could see, and those that were saved could see my faith in Christ. My priority that I've lived for Christ. I have trusted him. I did not withhold it. Do you think today, this past year, our churches has withheld some profitable things? They've withheld some profitable things that people needed. People needed these to see us strong. People needed to see us like Oh, people needed to see us believe it. That through all of this, we could come together in the house of God and kneel around an altar and get in the word of God and preach and pray and believe God will see us through. But we shrunk. We shrunk. Paul said, I didn't do that. And when I write my report, to say that I didn't do that. I tried to be straight, shoot straight, tell people. Look at what he said in verse 21. I will get through all of these. There's nine of them. I'm going to have to hurry. The message, look at what he said in verse 20, uh, 21. Therefore testify both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The message is the same to all. Have we, have we shrunk back a little bit? If you're in a group of believers that you call brothers and sisters in Christ, did you use the same language? Did you use the same stories when you were in the midst of those that were lost? It's very important. The message must be same to the same to all people. It doesn't matter who they are. And what is it? What is that message? To repent toward God. Notice how what he said there. To repent toward God. He's not talking about here of repenting toward each other. He's talking about repenting toward God. He's talking about when we look at our life, that we see the holiness of God and we see how righteous God is and it brings us to repentance because of the way that we live our life. Oh, how many, how many times I have to tell God I'm sorry? How many times do I have to say to God myself, I have to say to him over and over again, when I see my life and the way I live and I see you, my Father, I see how holy and righteous you are and I see how weak I am. I see how I fail you so much. God, forgive me. Re I want to repent of it. Paul said, I repent toward God. In my report, I see my failures. And I repent. But also, the, that must be the message that, that we give to all people. Listen, don't ever, ever sell yourself as one who is self-righteous. Don't ever sell you. That will turn sinners off quicker than anything else. Why? Because Paul said, I have to repent toward God also. And when we tell people that we're weak also, when we try to talk to them about the holiness of God, 
But the message is the same to all in faith. Toward the Christ. Notice that word toward again. It is toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The message must be the same to all. That we're saved through the work of Christ. That we're trusting in Christ. Nothing that I can do in my report that's going to save my soul. My report reads, Christ. Christ, all in all. Paul was saying that's all I've ever preached was Christ and my faith toward him. Look in verse 22. I want to get through all of these. So I'm, I, I, we, we could preach every one of them. We could just stay here and take them one by one and preach them. But I want to get through all of them. I want you to see the final report. In verse 22, he said, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Now, I want you to title this one, number five. The power of personal conviction. First one was a faithfulness, a humble mind, that we do not shrink from the, the message, that the message is the same to all. And number five is the power of personal conviction. W one thing to see about this verse of Scripture. You see the power of the conviction of Paul because when he says here, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's his Spirit. That's his Spirit. Because if you'll go on and look a little further on down, I believe in uh, another one of the verses, uh, verses or chapter 21, I believe you'll find that the Spirit of God actually forbade Paul to go. The Spirit of God did not want to go. But Paul had so much conviction. He went anyway, and knowing not what would befall him there. But you see, he had love for his lost brethren. In Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, Paul said, If my brethren could be saved, I would be a, become accursed. In other words, he said, I would be cast aside. Cast out if my brethren could be served, uh, saved. That's the power of personal conviction about what God can do in making a difference in our life. You see, whether the Spirit of God leads us or not, because we're saved and because we have the Spirit of God living in us, we are to be convicted over sinners all the time. We ought to always be concerned about sinners. Does it mean that we might always talk to sinners? No, but we ought to be concerned about them because I believe the Spirit of God leads us to talk to sinners, to certain ones. But I believe that we ought to have personal conviction that every person that's lost in this congregation this morning brings to me a broken heart and would cause me to take the steps that might lead to the unknown in my life because of my love for them. You see, the power of personal conviction makes us blind to danger. Blind to the dangers that's around us. I never will forget. I told this story one time. I believe may have told it to you. I was, hadn't been pastoring long and I knew of a man that was in a motorcycle gang but I knew his family family came to church where I was said go talk to him I don't, I don't mind telling you I was scared because he, he was a rough dude in a motorcycle gang but I remember going to that house because I cared about him. And I shared the gospel of Christ with him. 
Whether he's in church today or not, I know his wife is serving the Lord. The power of conviction will lead us sometimes to the dangers that we do not know about. But it causes us to be willing to surrender our life if need be. And that's what Paul was saying in his report. I will give my life if it need be for my brethren. Can we read that in our report? Can we? Think about that. Sometimes it's difficult, church, but we're still called to do it. But let's look in verse 23. It says, save that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me. Number six. Under the witness of the Holy Spirit of God, Paul was told, wherever you go, in whatever city you go, whatever village you go, persecution will be with you. The Spirit of God had told Paul that. Now, you, can you imagine this? Can you imagine that everywhere you went with the gospel, there would be hostility, there would be bonds, there would be cords, there would be prison, there would be beating. Everywhere you went. Would you write that in your report about yourself? We say so many times we don't want to say anything. We So many times we don't want to do anything. Why? Because we're afraid. We're afraid what might befall us. The Spirit of God had told Paul, it doesn't matter where you go, Paul. It's going to go with you. And you know what? When we're walking right with Christ, no matter where we go, the Spirit of God says, danger is with you when you tell people about Jesus. And I believe we're going to see it more this coming year than ever before. If you can write that in your report, that you're willing to go no matter where, this year's report, it'll help you to face next year. Because next year is going to be the same way. Affliction is within us a pressure burdens and troubles telling the people the truth you and I know as Christians today you and I know as preachers today this coming year is going to be a tough year it's going to be a tough year telling people telling people what sin is Telling people, warning them, it's going to be a tough year. But the Spirit of God says, you must do it wherever you go. And danger will be there with you. Let's go a little further. Verse 24 but none of these things move me. Neither I count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Number seven. How's things moved you this year? How have you been moved by the things around you this year? That's what Paul was saying here. Verse 24, but none of these things move me. How's this, all the things that's happened this past year affected you? Now notice the one thing he said, and remember this. The Word of God, listen to this. I know it's tough. But we're pilgrims and strangers passing through a wicked world. Our home awaits us 
on the other side of this life. God has never promised us that this life would be easy. And the first thing Paul said, my life don't count. You really want to serve the Lord. You really want to be happy in the Lord. You really want to be in the center of God's word. Live your life every day as if your life don't count. That only his life counts. Now you know I'm, Paul said, Galatians 20, 2, 20, when he said, I die daily. I die daily that Christ might live in me. How does it move you this week? Well, we look around us and we can see that it's affected an awful lot of people. What does matter? My life don't matter. But he said something did matter. And you know what that was? Finishing my course with joy. Finishing my course with joy. Church, I want to lay down on my deathbed and to be happy because I have finished my course. And there's joy in my heart that I have tried to be faithful and serve my Lord as best I know how. And then when death comes, joy will come. I wonder how many people today just ask this question. It's a hard question. But it has to be asked. How many is people how many people's work stopped this past year? How many people just quit doing? Just quit doing anything. They just stay at home. How are you going to finish your course? You're not going to finish it at home. You're not going to finish it laying down on Christ. But how many people are, were holding office when the governor said churches can't meet? Sit down. It didn't matter what the job they had. It didn't matter how they, they served. They weren't about to finish their course. They're just going to quit. Now, if you can tell me that God's happy with that, then you're not going to kid me, but you sure have kidded yourself. Do you think that somewhere along the way God would have told Paul, well, Paul, you've had enough. It's time to stop. Just stop it. I mean, Paul, he didn't tell Paul that. So Paul said, I'm going on because I want to die in joy. Finishing my course. Someone said uh, recently, I believe it was Alan said this. When the year-end reports are finished, I mean, I wonder how many churches in Wilkes County will have shut down completely I believe if this church was established under the leadership of the spirit of God and I want to tell y'all something as long as I'm here it's not going to stop we're not going to say it's finished Why? Because he said, I've received the ministry. All of you that are serving today, you're holding a ministry that God has given you. And God has allowed you to hold that ministry. Are you just going to stop on him? Or are you going to follow through and be faithful and finish with joy in your heart? All of you know if you run a race, That the happy people are the ones who cross the finish line. 
Not the ones that fail on the way or the ones that quit, but the ones who cross the finish line. I've received a ministry and we must be faithful. Number eight, look at verses 25 through 27. This is his departing statement, number eight. Verses 25 through 27. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. He knew when he left there, I'll not see you again on this side. Now let me ask you a question. Will I ever see you again? Will you ever see me again? What will my report be that you will have if you never see me again? What will your report reflect about you if I never see you again? So Paul said here of the of God, of kingdom of the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Examine my record, he said. My hands are clean of the blood of men. Paul talked to kings. He talked to religious leaders. He talked to all that would listen. Therefore, he said, my hands are clean. They have no blood on them. Today in our churches, I'm afraid our hands, if your hands are like my hands, you got blood on them. My report won't reflect what Paul's report was because I do have blood on those hands. But here's something else. Remember this, if you're teaching a Sunday school class, if you're a deacon, or if you're preaching the Word of God, Paul said, I preached the whole counsel of God. He said, I didn't preach just what I wanted people to hear. I didn't shun the difficult things, but I preached the whole counsel of God. Will that be in my report, that he preached the whole counsel of God? That's very, very important. Did you live the whole counsel of God? You see, our, our report doesn't look too good in some areas, does it? But the last of all, number nine, look at what he said in verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul said, I know what's behind me. And when you look around you today, church, you know what's behind you too. An awful lot of preachers out there that's not preaching the whole counsel of God. An awful lot of preachers out there that's not being faithful. And those preachers will come behind you. And they'll be like raging wolves. They'll tear apart the body of believers. But that's why it's my responsibility to make sure that you know that once I'm gone, you've been preached to and you've been taught. And the next guy that comes to fill this pulpit or pulpit will not be a raging wolf. Will not be one who's going to come to up, upset the work of God. Why? Because you're going to recognize him. And you're not going to allow him to enter into your pulpit. That's the kind of report we need to have for the end of the year. God bless you. I appreciate you and love you. 
If anyone wants to come this morning, if you don't know Christ, I tell you, you need Jesus. If you don't, you're going to die and go to hell without him. Put your faith in him. And if there's any of you that have pulled back, come and ask God to forgive you. And say, I want to move forward by simply trusting in you, my Lord. Let's all stand.